concludes the discovery of formal business. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator McCarthy. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. Pursuing to Standing Order 75, I give notice today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. Helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them, and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. Mr. President, having an Australian passport used to mean something. It used to mean that your government looked after you when you were in a crisis, when you were stranded, when you are in trouble. It used to mean safety, protection and security. But as we've seen in recent weeks with Australians stranded in India, it seems to mean that the Morrison government is going to leave you behind. 9,000. 500 Aussies in India, 950 of them considered vulnerable, and tragically, 173 unaccompanied children all left behind by Scott Morrison. Last week in the COVID committee, we heard the moving story of a Sydney parent, Dylan. Dylan told the committee that he and his wife had not seen their young daughter for almost 17 months, despite constant efforts to get her home from India. Dylan said, we have not seen our daughter grow. When her grandma says she has grown, I feel sad. We have not been able to see her grow taller. It's time we have lost and we can never get back. I cannot imagine how difficult it is for this family. How could any parent be separated from their child from that long during their child's young formative years and not feel that loss deeply. We still don't know when Dylan and his wife will be reunited with their precious child. I asked DFAT officials in this, the COVID committee hearings whether they had considered sending a special mercy flight to India to specifically bring home children who were separated from their parents in the middle of this global pandemic. And the officials confirmed that the government had not. Let's be clear. Banning Australian citizens from trying to return home from India and threatening them with jail and with fines is unprecedented. It did not have to be this way. It did not have to be this way because the Morrison government has failed in its responsibility for quarantine. If there had been a national quarantine facility, as Jane Halton recommended to the Prime Minister, more stranded Australians would have been able to get home to safety. These Australians, these stranded Australians, our fellow citizens, our mates, would already be home if the Prime Minister had just done his job and ensured that the federal government had been responsible for quarantine, something it's been responsible for now for over a hundred years, instead he's left these Australians behind, trapped overseas and exposed to the coronavirus. Now, the Chief Medical Officer, Paul Kelly, said last week that the India travel ban is a direct result of a lack of quarantine facilities. So let's just be clear. Scott Morrison ignored Jane Halton's recommendation mm. to set up national quarantine facilities with surge capacity to get stranded Australians home. If Scott Morrison had taken that advice from his hand-picked expert Jane Halton, if he had listened one of the three times that she briefed him on her report, if he had acted Australians in India would already be home. 
they would not have been left behind by this Prime Minister. Now, of course we need to follow medical advice. Nobody is suggesting otherwise. Of course we need to keep the virus out of Australia. No one is suggesting otherwise. But the best way of protecting Australians is through a proper national quarantine system and getting on with the vaccine rollout. Quarantine and vaccination, the two jobs that the federal government, the Morrison government had during this pandemic, and they are failing at both. The truth is our, our current quarantine arrangements are unable to deal with a surge in demand during a crisis. The exact circumstances that were referred to in the Halton report Inadequate quarantine facilities mean we are unable to deal with the 40,000 Australians who are still stranded overseas and can't get home to Australia. And this failure sits squarely with the Prime Minister. Quarantine has been a federal responsibility for 120 years. The Prime Minister used to know this. He used to hold the job of Minister for Immigration, and he got and commissioned for himself a big trophy. I stopped the boats, he said. He used to be responsible for the borders, but I tell you what, he is stopping Australian citizens from getting back to their home country because he is washing his hands of quarantine. He is ducking responsibility. He failed to act. He shoved it all onto the states. This I don't hold a hose mate attitude of Scott Morrison, I don't run quarantine, he says. I'm not responsible for aged care, except he is. The vaccine rollout, not my fault. Australians are getting sick and tired of a prime minister who fails to take responsibility, who ducks and waves, and who does not act. Scott Morrison is all about the re-election of Scott Morrison. Everything he does is designed to ensure that he is never responsible for any problem, but he's always around to take credit when things go well. When Gladys Berejiklian and Dan Andrews acted during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, they saved Australia. The Australian citizens responded to the leadership of Dan Andrews and Gladys Berejiklian. But where was Scott Morrison? The Australian people are to be credited for following the advice and the leadership of the state premiers and chief ministers. Where was Scott Morrison? All he did was stand around after national cabinet and announce what the premiers told him he was already, that they were going to do. That's not leadership. Scott Morrison is all about Scott Morrison. He is not about the Australian people. And he is not on the side of the Australian people. If Scott Morrison were, was on Australian side, he would have rolled out the vaccine. He would have secured enough vaccine deals. He would have ensured we didn't put all our eggs in one basket, the AstraZeneca basket. He would have implemented a national quarantine system that his own hand-picks expert, Jane Halton, told him to do. Let's remember, the Prime Minister said, we're at the front of the queue, Australia, when it comes to vaccines. We're nowhere near the front of the queue. We're 100th in the world. We're up the back of the class. This is a prime minister who loves an announcement, but doesn't pay attention to the details of delivery. This is a prime minister who promised we'd have four million Australians vaccinated by the end of March. We get to the end of May, we're nowhere near that. We're not even, we're not, he's now promising six million, six million are going to be vaccinated I think his deadline is by the end of May. We're not going to hit that. This is a government that always loves an announcement, doesn't pay attention to the delivery. Understand where we're at. When the Prime Minister says we're at the front of the queue, we are lagging behind countries like Mongolia, El Salvador, and Panama. Mongolia, El Salvador, and Panama are doing a better job vaccinating their citizens than the Morrison government is doing vaccinating Australians. We were supposed to have every adult in the country, Scott Morrison announced, vaccinated by the end of October. That's laughable and it's tragic. 
The failure is tragic. And the people who are paying for it most acutely right now are Australian citizens and permanent residents who are stranded in India. As Senator Matt Canavan said, we shouldn't be jailing our fellow citizens. We should be fixing quarantine to help get these people home. As Senator Patterson said, this is a step too far threatening to jail our fellow citizens who want to come home in the middle of a tragic humanitarian crisis. More than 22 million people in India have the virus. More than 246 people have lost their lives. They have a shortage of oxygen in hospitals. This is a difficult time for India. My heart goes out to our friends in India. The help we give them is right, but we need Senator to get our fellow Kenealy, Australians your time home. Has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, I really felt like after we'd been out of this place for six weeks, it was like coming back to school, new year, new teacher almost. You weren't quite sure what room you were supposed to be in. But clearly, those opposite missed out on that. They haven't quite got the same fresh approach to when we come back after six weeks because they are still sprouting the same old negative energy that nothing is right, nothing is ever good enough. It wouldn't matter which way we looked, which way we went, those opposite would find a way to complain. But what I think it is incredibly interesting, though, Madam Acting Deputy President, is it's not everyone in Labor who currently has looked at the situation in India and constantly flip-flopped and changed their position, who've taken a politically expedient position just because it's the opposite of what the Morrison government's done. In fact, there's many in Labor that have actually embraced the decisions that the Morrison government has made based on health advice, making sure that Australians are safe. And I just thought I would take this opportunity to remind those opposite of what some of their colleagues have said. And perhaps they might like to take this on board and, with regards to their objections, may like to raise it with them, because it might get a little bit awkward at some of those federal council convention things you all get together with. So Mark McGowan, now admittedly, not a big fan, not a big fan of the Premier of the one-party state, said he could do it all, and then as soon as he got one case, shut the borders again and shut everybody down, closed the businesses, panicked overreaction, the knee-jerk McGowan that we always tend to see. But even Mark McGowan here decided to support Prime Minister Morrison and the coalition government, and I quote, with more and more arrivals coming from India, we need to seriously look at temporarily restricting the travel of people who've been in or through India. They're trying to put a stop to the third wave happening in Australia. That'd be us. Morrison government trying to stop that third wave. And we need to do everything we can to keep this double mutant variety away. So it was in fact the West Australian Premier, Mark McGowan, come, came out urging, urging. In fact, normally when it's Mr McGowan, it's demanding, but I think he urged the federal government to suspend flights out of India. There needs to be a suspension, Mr McGowan told reporters. But it wasn't just Mr McGowan in the one state place of WA. It was also up in Queensland, Princess Palaszczuk, the woman who likes to claim everything. Senator Urquhart. I would ask that the um, senator opposite call those by their appropriate names. Senator Hughes, you need to use the appropriate titles. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Anastasia Prem uh, Palaszczuk, Premier of Queensland, the other state known for slamming those borders shut, ruining its tourism industry at every opportunity, but then sticking its hand out for the federal government to bail out its industries yet again. But even Premier Palaszczuk came to the table on this one. She welcomed the news that the federal government's decision that we increased aid to India, but while she acknowledged the decision to suspend flights was difficult for families, and to quote Premier Palaszczuk, it's the right decision at this time. And when Premier Palaszczuk even gets that COVID is unprecedented and at different times we need to take different responses, 
I think it says something to those opposite that they need to pay a little more attention to their colleagues. But it's not just the state premiers. No, no, no. It's, it's quite a few that sit over in the other chamber. And in fact, the leader of the opposition himself quoted here, saying it's understandable these border closures have occurred given what's occurred in India. Have, have happened given what's occurred in India. They recommend the health officials recommended a reduction, and I think that's appropriate. But of course, whilst Mr Albanese likes to have a bet each way, and I won't use the term that he is colloquially known as, in respect of those opposite, it was his predecessor, Bill Shorten, who was in, the member for Maribyrnong. Senator Hughes. Sorry, Maribyrnong. Senator Hughes, you do need to use the appropriate titles. Sometimes forget what the name of their seats are. My apologies. <laughs> Senators are much easier to term to remember. The member for Maribyrnong. He came out claiming that it was well past time to shut our borders to flights from India. The former leader of the opposition, the man who told Arnie Schwarzenegger he was going to be Prime Minister, the next PM of Australia, he wanted to let us all know, to quote, but let's be clear. As a general principle, let's just close the borders for traffic from India and then we can send them to supplies. So whilst we have acted on the health advice, whilst we have looked to keep Australians safe, whilst we have acted to ensure that a third wave of COVID does not occur in Australia, we were actually supported in this remarkably by a number of people on the opposite side. Unfortunately, in their party room or caucus meeting, that, probably, that message didn't get through to the senators putting forward an MPI today. But when it comes to the vaccine rollout, roll of course, we get the same boo-hoo, isn't it terrible story. No recognition last week was the largest number of vaccines delivered across the country. Uh, the vaccines are being rolled out, and as every country's experienced, every country when they've started their vaccine rollout, it's had to be done under a safe and measured way. And as we're seeing, these numbers are now increasing exponentially. And I hate to think how upset you'll be when we do start to see increased numbers vaccinated. In fact, the fantastic work of Gladys Berejiklian means those 40 to 49, of which I only just slip into that age group, have been able to register for a vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine I registered yesterday on the New South Wales government website. If only every state was as effective as New South Wales, I'm sure you'd all be in a much happier place. I don't know what Senator Keneally's got against Mongolia or Salvador or Panama, but I'm not sure she'll be getting an invitation to visit any of them soon. But I mean, just a couple of things that India has done that we might like to recognise and that the world is now looking to look to them and support them in response to the generosity that they showed prior to the crisis that is now enveloping that country. Prior to India experiencing this COVID wave, they had actually exported 66 million doses of a vaccine globally. In our region, to Nauru and to Fiji, 10,000 to Nauru and 100,000 to Fiji. They've manufactured over 130,000 vaccines for Papua New Guinea and 24,000 for the Solomon Islands. And a chartered flight left Sydney on Wednesday, just last week, carrying essential medical supplies, which included over 1,000 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators, as part of the Australian government's initial package to assist. This is the initial part of the package. This assistance will continue as globally India is being supported, particularly in recognition of the generosity it showed prior to its COVID crisis. India has, of course, got 9,000 Australians waiting to come home, of which 900 have been uh, marked as uh, in a high-risk group. From the 15th of May, we will start to see repatriation flights. 
And there are a couple of states that have decided that they will participate in that quarantine of the repatriation. And the federal government, along with the ACT running the Howard Springs quarantine facility, will be there to bring those Indian Australians, Australian Indians, I'm probably getting my mixed around there, but they will be on their way home through repatriation flights commencing May 15. But don't let the truth get in the way of a good scare campaign over there. These Australians will be coming home, and they'll be coming home in a safe way that's not only safe for them, it's not only safe for the frontline workers that will work with them through the quarantine period, but it's safe for the whole Australian community. And that's the way the Morrison government has approached all of COVID. Our decisions are based on health advice. Our decisions are based on how to best keep all Australians safe. We've seen increases just since February into March of the number of Australians coming home. This is going to continue to increase. It's not helped when states decide to shut down everything over one case of COVID. Again, I would urge them to look to the Berejiklian government for leadership and how to manage this crisis. But I think rather than scaremongering, we should look to the solutions, appreciate the support that the Indians are getting and know that they will start coming home from May 15. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, my heart goes out to the people of India who are basically experiencing immeasurable suffering at this moment. We are thinking of you and we are trying to do everything we can to support you and to push the Australian government to meet its moral obligations. The government's disregard for the lives and the health of people overseas has become striking over the past couple of weeks. The Morrison government's threat of jail time for stranded Australians trying to return home from India is absolutely horrific, it's discriminatory, and it is racist. The move was a reminder for non-white migrants to this country that our citizenship will always be conditional. For migrants of colour, terms and conditions will always apply to our citizenship. In the fine print, you discover that for you, being Australian means greater scrutiny, harsher policy responses and fewer protections. You find out pretty quickly that we are all in this together is a false slogan. Some of us will always be excluded. Healthcare is a human right. Your visa, citizenship or COVID status shouldn't change that. People whose homes and lives are here must be brought back immediately. Australia should also be flying back any sick citizens, permanent residents and partners home for treatment and the cost of quarantine and flights should be covered by the government. Quarantine facilities should be humane, comfortable, safe, these should be places where people can stay with dignity. It is beyond unacceptable that Prime Minister Scott Morrison thinks it's the right thing to leave sick people in India with no access to local vaccines or work rights, little access to health care and no prospect of coming home with partners or family members when they are allowed to return. The subcontinent diaspora that I've been speaking to are telling me that they are feeling like second-rate citizens. They are telling me again and again that their hearts are heavy, thinking about loved ones suffering the consequences of the pandemic. They are telling me that they dread phone calls from India because they will inevitably bear bad news. We must do everything we can to also provide healthcare aid and resources to India and make sure that they are delivered to those in need. I urge the government to immediately return Australian citizens, permanent residents and their partners in India back home to Australia. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I also rise today to support the motions put forward by Senator McCarthy. Um, now, I've previously risen in this place on a number of occasions to speak on the government's failure to secure safe passage home for vulnerable Australians abroad uh, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And since this first issue arose, 
I have been immensely disappointed by the lack of action from those opposite to assist our fellow citizens. My office, like many others in this place, has probably been inundated with requests, appeals for help, for assistance by their government, by the Australian government. They are so desperate to come home, home to a safe place, and not because they have decided to just pack up and leave Australia and go on a holiday, but because they have been trying for months to come back to Australia. Months. Once upon a time, not so long ago, Australian governments have understood their responsibility, that they have to assist Australians in need who are overseas. Once upon a time, Australian governments would have sought to actively facilitate those in strife returning home to safety. But sadly, this understanding has been lost by this coalition government. Their responsibility has been lost. There are something in the order of around 9,500 Australians currently stranded in India. Almost 1,000 of them are considered vulnerable. Almost 200 of them are unaccompanied children. These are Australians that have been abandoned, abandoned by their government, and there's no other way to characterise it. These are Australians that the government have made clear they aren't in the mood to help. But up until recently, the message to these people was, for all intents and purposes, you got yourself into this place, you get yourself out. And we have heard the stories of many Australians, many Australians who have tried to organise flights, who have tried to organise ways to get home, to fund and fac facilitate their own return to Australia, independent of this government. But as if on a mission to compound their misery, the government has decided to up the ante, to threaten these people, these fellow Australians, with imprisonment, imprisonment upon their return. At no point were such measures required when the global hotspots were in China or Italy or in the United Kingdom. So why do this now? Why now? I mean, the answer seems plain and clear, that this government's complete inability to manage our quarantine system appropriately has led us to this point. And if we had a proper quarantine system in place, we wouldn't be here today. These Australians would already be home with their families. But instead, what we have is this hot mess, this abandonment of their responsibilities of those opposite, their abandonment of their responsibilities of their constitutional obligations. We should always follow the health advice. There is no doubt about that. But we also need to do what we can to make sure that advice like this never, never becomes necessary. One is left to wonder just how little confidence do the medical authorities have in the government's quarantine arrangements that would lead them to providing advice like this. And we've had members of the coalition, Senator Patterson, Senator Canavan, as I'd asked questions in question time earlier today to the minister, about their views that this government needs to do a better job at making sure that stranded Aussies have a right to come home and should be assisted to, in doing so. But the answer was very clear. This government is focused on making sure that whatever they can to make it very hard for those who are currently over in India, that they don't get a chance to come home safely, that they have to wait for the government to sort out the mess here, sort out the mess that they should have looked after some months ago, not just relying on the state governments to pick up the tab, and manage our quarantine system. It is the federal government's responsibility, quarantine. So the way ahead is clear that this government needs to admit that they got it wrong and they need to work hard to fix it. As members of the government themselves have said, they should be helping stranded Aussies in India to get home, not locking them up for making their own way here. The time for blaming others is over. The finger pointing at the states must end. Quarantine is a federal responsibility and has been since Federation. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I would like to start by expressing my deepest support and solidarity with India as it continues to respond to this ongoing crisis. Australia 
is both a close friend and comprehensive strategic partner of India, and we stand with them as they continue to confront this uh, surge in COVID-19 cases. Uh, we have a vibrant, uh, almost 70,000 strong uh, Indian diaspora in Western Australia who make up part of the 700,000 Indians who live across Australia, uh, all who form an important and integral part of our local communities. Uh, we have all seen that uh, in our own communities, no doubt every single senator here in this place. Uh, knows what a valuable contribution uh, those uh, that have decided to, to move here and raise their families here are making in this, uh, in this great country of ours. Uh, so Our thoughts, of course, are with the thousands of Australians who are uh, still living in, in India. Uh, it remains an extremely difficult time for our friends in India. Australians in India and those uh, with loved ones over there are experiencing, no doubt, significant stress. Uh, we continue to stand uh, with them and we remain committed to doing everything we can to support India through this. Uh, India has shown both leadership and generosity during the COVID-19 pandemic. They've exported over 66 million vaccines globally, including uh, to our neighbours in the Pacific. Uh, so now it's our turn to repay that amazing generosity and show our support to India. Just last week, uh, we chartered a uh, flight to India, delivered uh, essential medical services, uh, medical supplies rather, uh, as part of the Australian government's package to assist India as they combat COVID-19. This shipment included uh, 1,056 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators. We've also helped the Indian Air Force collect four privately sourced oxygen tanks from my home state in Western Australia. The government is continuing to work with both state and federal, uh, state and territory governments, as well as the uh, private sector, to help assist with the urgent deployment of further support. Helping Australians return home continues to remain a key priority, a key priority of this government. We made the call to pause flights from India to ensure that we prevent the virus from coming back and starting a third wave here in Australia. Temporary restrictions on arrivals into Australia help to balance the interests of Australians who are seeking to return home while also managing the risks uh, to the wider community and, of course, public health. Restrictions like this are critical to the integrity of Australia's quarantine system as well as the safety of the Australian community as a whole. And we have used this method before. Closing our borders and utilising quarantine for returning Australians is not something new. Australia was one of the first countries to close our international borders when the pandemic first began. It has proven to be the best strategy to protect the health of all Australians during the pandemic, and it has helped us maintain a way of life which is, of course, the envy of the world. There has been uh, nationally uh, widespread support for the temporary pause, the temporary pause on travel from India. Uh, WA's Premier Mark McGowan went on the record multiple times last month promising a temporary uh, proposing ban, rather a temporary ban on arrivals from India. He even went so far as to urge the federal government to suspend flights out of India, describing India as the epicenter of death and destruction. Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk also backed our choice to suspend flights into Australia, saying other countries have done a temporary suspension. I don't think that would be out of kilter uh, for Queensland and Australia to do the same. The Shadow Health spokesman, Mr Butler, member for Hindmarsh, also supported the pause of flights and stated, given the scale of the crisis in India right now, the proper thing to do is to pause travel from India to Australia. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, member for Grainler, also noted it's understandable these border closures, given what has occurred in India. Yet now, all of a sudden, he's saying that the Commonwealth has a duty to abandon, not to abandon Australians stuck in India. So which is it, Mr Albanese? Are the temporary restrictions understandable or not? It's pretty simple. 
India is currently identified as a high-risk country due to the significant, significant increase in positive case numbers in return travellers from India. Of the recent cases of COVID-19 detected in hotel quarantine in Australia, over 50 per cent of cases since mid-April 2021 of overseas acquired cases reported have uh, cases reported have acquired their infection in India. What the government has done is respond to the current situation, ensure that we protect Australians both overseas and in India. And we're seeing positive signs from this latest temporary pause of flights, which has reduced the number of positive cases within the quarantine system to a level that is manageable and to reduce the risk of COVID entering the community. A number of confirmed cases in How the number of confirmed cases in Howard Springs are also starting to fall. So the government remains committed to continuing to bring people back safely from India, but we have to make sure that we do it in a way that won't subject the rest of Australia to a third wave of COVID-19. The Biosecurity Act was deliberately drafted broadly to protect Australians from health risks. These tools will always be used responsibly and proportionally. These measures have been in place for 14 months, and in that time, they have been used very judiciously to protect Australia. So it is not fair to suggest that these penalties, in their most extreme forms, will be likely to be imposed uh, anywhere. When you go into Western Australia, uh, and this has been the case for, I, I suspect, decades, uh, you have restrictions on the, uh, on the importing and the bringing in of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and nuts and various things. And there are penalties if you do that. There are very strong penalties if, uh, that, that could go in the extreme if one does that. And so just because there might be an upper limit of a penalty doesn't mean that we need to scaremonger around this particular issue. Australians that are trying to get back into Australia are under, uh, that are in India right now are under immense uh, stress and pressure. And we don't need scaremongering. We need to obviously work as judiciously as we possibly can to see flights returned, to see as many flights come back in and ensure that our quarantine system is able to deal with it. Since the start of the pandemic, the Australian government has helped over 45,200 Australians return home, including 18,500 people on 125 government facilitated flights. Of these, 38 flights have departed from India, so far assisting around 6,300 Australians. Over 20,000 Australians who have registered with DFAT in India have safely returned since the pandemic began. Now, there are still 9,000 Australians in India who are all keen to return home, of which 900 are considered vulnerable. And as of 15 May, government charter repatriation flights to the Centre for National Resilience uh, to the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs for returning Aussies with India will resume. An estimated 1,000 Australians will be able to return home by the end of June, with one repatriation flight into Howard Springs every seven to nine days. We have put in place new measures for all flights resuming from India to the Northern Territory, requiring all returning Aussies to provide both a negative and COVID-19 chain reaction test and a negative rapid antigen test prior to boarding. These new measures will help protect those returning, uh, those returning home and the Australian community at large as well. So we are helping Aussies who are in India return to Australia. We are not leaving them stranded. We have done the tough job of making sure our quarantine facility has the capacity to handle those coming in from overseas. And it has helped ensure that we protect Australian communities and prevent any further outbreak of COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The fact that Australians have not been able to return home at a time of international emergency is a clear indication of how this government has failed when it comes to meeting their responsibilities to keep all Australians safe. All Australians 
not just those lucky enough to be within our borders when the COVID pandemic hit. Quarantine is clearly a responsibility of the federal government, but one this government has shirked from the beginning of this pandemic. The Northern Territory government stepped up to the challenge when the pandemic hit. A dormant workers' camp on the outskirts of Darwin at Howard Springs was offered up as a place where Australians returning from countries where the virus was raging could quarantine before returning to their homes. The first Australian coronavirus evacuees from Wuhan arrived at Howard Springs last February. Since then, it's developed into, and this is February last year. Since then, it's developed into what health experts have called a gold standard purpose-built infection control facility, safely quarantining thousands of arrivals, including domestic travellers, overseas fruit pickers, international students and repatriated Australians. Throughout the pandemic, NT Health has been managing the domestic section of the facility where no cases of coronavirus have been recorded in people arriving in the NT from interstate. Mr Acting Deputy President, can I take this opportunity uh, to speak directly to our frontline workers in the Northern Territory, in particular at Howard Springs and the OSMAT team, under the guidance of the Chief Health Officer, Dr Hugh Heggie, and now uh, Acting Chief uh, Health Officer, Dr Charles Payne, a deep and sincere thank you from not only uh, this side of the Senate, but indeed the Australian Parliament because it is you who are working at the front line and have been uh, consistently since February 2019 to take care of vulnerable Australians and indeed those Australians who now just wish to travel across the country and who know that that is a place they can go to quarantine. But there are still Australians, so many thousands of Australians, still stuck overseas who so desperately want to come home without having to have the threat of a jail sentence on the top of them. The Commonwealth has been managing international arrivals, Mr Acting Deputy President, and management is now being handed over to the Northern Territory. Throughout the pandemic, NT Health has been managing the domestic section of the facility, where no cases, as I said, of coronavirus have been recorded in people arriving in the NT from interstate. So under the federal agreement, Capacity at Howard Springs will increase to 2,000 individuals per fortnight. 2,000 extra Australians are able to come into Darwin and feel safe. I have no doubt the Northern Territory and all of those frontline workers, not only just in health but also in emergency services, our retail sector, the bus drivers, the transport workers who need to be so much a part of this safety mechanism in protecting Australians from coronavirus, giving a place for quarantining, but just as importantly protecting the Territorians who live and who so generous, generously welcome uh, all Australians to that facility. So I have no doubt the Northern Territory will continue to do an excellent job in running a gold standard quarantine service. The federal government would have been better served by using Howard Springs as a model for quarantine facilities elsewhere in the country. We would perhaps not be facing the situation where not only have Australians in India been banned from coming home, they have been threatened with jail time and huge fines if they do so. How horrific is that on top of an already desperate and depressing situation for those families wanting their loved ones back in this country. If the Morrison government had not so comprehensively failed to deliver our vaccination program, we would not have to be banning Australians from coming home. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. 
People both here in Australia and around the world were in fact disgusted when our government announced that the, tra the travel ban and then further threatening to jail and fine Australian citizens and permanent residents if they dared try and return home from India. India is suffering a terrible humanitarian crisis, with COVID cases continuing to spike. Right now, people need help. Australian citizens and permanent residents in India need help. The Morrison government has abandoned our citizens and residents trying to escape and come home from a desperate situation. There are, there are 9,500 Australians in, in India right now who would like to come home. That includes 950 vulnerable people and 173 unaccompanied minors, which the government didn't even know about until there were questions asked in the COVID committee last week. The government introduced this racist ban because that's what it is, because our ho held hotel quarantine system is not up to scratch. It cannot handle permanent cases with a guarantee of those cases not with, uh, with those cases or COVID not escaping them. And we've had examples of that. The whole point of quarantine is to be able to handle positive cases. That's the whole point. And yet what's happened over the last 12 months is the Commonwealth offloading responsibility, which it has for quarantine under our laws, onto the states and then continuing to refuse to fix the system that is clearly broken, to take and show the leadership to make sure that we had, we had quarantine facilities around this country that were the best they could possibly be. We do have Howard Springs and that's being expanded, not quickly enough to deal with the most immediate crisis in India. And people may think that the government is acting. But all they have done is announce three guaranteed flights once the ban ends. That should end now. Those flights should be leaving to bring people home. The first three flights will only bring home 450 people. There's 950 vulnerable, let alone the other 9,000 that still need to come home. The government has no timeline, no timeline to bring them home and can only actually guarantee they'll get 450 home at the moment with the possibility of another potentially three flights that may then get some more of the vulnerable Senator home. Seward, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Here is my question to, to Labor. Is it OK to shut borders to protect citizens and ensure internal health services are not overwhelmed? Or is it not? I mean, it's a simple question. And if you don't think it is appropriate, then why don't you ring Premier Mark McGowan, who shut his border on the 5th of April last year, right through to December? Nine months a nine-month ban on travel. I had a member of staff born and raised in Perth. She could not go home to visit her family for the nine months. You might want to call on uh, Premier Dan Andrews, who slammed his border shut with less than four hours' notice on New Year's Eve, preventing families from getting together to ring in the new year. You might want to ring um, Premier Palaszczuk, whose border was shut for eight months last year. Now, I am on the record speaking about those border closures. I am on the record speaking about the negative impact of families stuck on opposite sides of the border, supporting boarding school students and university students who couldn't get home for holidays and families who were split by a divide. I am on the record calling for common sense. But, I never once questioned the right of the state premiers to listen to health advice and impose restrictions they thought necessary to protect their citizens. And, and let's put it in context. Nine months, Western Australia, you, Mr Deputy Pre President, 
were restricted from travelling beyond your state borders other than the fact that uh, you're a, an essential worker in this place. Um, that was nine months. Our government announced this Indian travel ban on the 27th of April to come into effect on the 3rd of May. So no four-hour notice like Premier Andrews. We gave them a week's notice. And it is now being lifted on the 15th of May. Twelve days. Twelve days to buy us time to ensure that when we reopen and reaccept people returning to Australia from India, we have the capacity to, to care for them. In the middle of April, 50 per cent of all our quarantine COVID cases were returning travellers from India—50 per cent. At that rate, we would have been overwhelmed. Twelve days is what we asked for so that we can put in place systems to make sure we can care for our citizens. In the words of Premier McGowan, we need to do everything we can to keep this double mutant variant away, talking about the disease that has occurred in India. And when we reopen our borders on the 15th of May, we will be focusing on prioritising the most vulnerable and getting them home. And we will have the confidence that our systems won't be overwhelmed, that we can look after them. So I agree it is heartbreaking for families and for citizens who found themselves on the wrong side of this border ban temporarily. I, I share their concerns. But I also stand with the premiers from around this country, from both parties, Labor and Liberal alike, who have themselves taken measures to protect their citizens. And I stand with them to say we need confidence, we need to make sure that we have capacity, that our health systems are not overwhelmed, that we don't inadvertently do things that would make us vulnerable, because we don't want to be the next India. We don't want that level of COVID in this nation. We want, we want to keep our citizens safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. <coughs> Excuse me, Senator there. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the, the last contribution does just je demonstrate that the coalition government doesn't grasp the situation that they're in, doesn't grasp their responsibilities. I think I've got five minutes to, actually, by the way. Um, the, the, the government doesn't understand that, as Senator Patrick just said, with 12 months to prepare, it's the federal government's responsibility, the federal government's responsibility to de deliver quarantine services and vaccine services and a vaccine rollout that would keep Australians safe. You see, in the middle of last year, the Prime Minister said that all Australians overseas who wanted to come home would be home by Christmas. There's still 40,000 people waiting. In late Late last year, the Prime Minister said Australia would be at the front of the queue, the front of the queue for vaccines. Now we're last in the queue, a hundredth in the queue for vaccine delivery. This government's abjectly failed. The Prime Minister said four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. There's still less than three million Australians vaccinated now, and we're in May. The Prime Minister thinks this isn't a race. Of course it's a race. It's a race for our economy. It's a race for our public health. And the real human consequences of the government's failure to appreciate the urgency of the situation, to appreciate its responsibilities and to act, is the India ban last week. Lock them out and then threaten to lock them up. That's all that's left to this miserable excuse for a government 
its failure has real-world consequences for ordinary Australians. Last week, Ziva Narang, just 19 months old, staying with her grandmother. They couldn't get her, her family, on a, on a flight back last year. They are trapped. Here's what her parents told the committee. Every time I see her on the video cam, I feel like crying, but I can't cry in front of my own parents. It makes them so disheartened. And this miserable excuse for a government confounded completely. I remember having them all out there all through last year bellowing out, open the borders, open the borders, they said, confounded by the fact that Australians in the states and territories were rewarding the performance of state premiers who took a tough line on the pandemic. Well, you know what the difference was? The difference is that the state premiers have done their jobs. They have carefully examined their responsibilities, done their jobs and delivered, and the economic figures that ministers over there crow about are a result of the Senator delivery of the Baird, state governments, not the performance expired. of this joke of a government. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, it is the responsibility of the Australian government to assist uh, Australians who are in difficulty overseas, not to criminalise them for coming home. I'm going to say that again. It is the responsibility of the Australian government to assist Australians who are in difficulty overseas, not to criminalise them for coming home. And certainly, any such decision to do so should properly be the decision of the parliament, not some faceless official drafting an, an instrument and getting the minister to sign it into law. A single minister should never have the authority to outcast an Australian from coming home. It's improper and it's immoral. There are uh, powers available to the minister to deal with Australians that return home, to put them in quarantine, to make the uh, Australian citizenry uh, safe. Uh, the government has, of course, failed in its, uh, its setup of quarantine. We know from the COVID committee that it is a capacity restriction that has caused uh, this um, instrument to be uh, brought into effect. Uh, and I'd just indicate to the, to the Senate, I, um, noting it's on the notice paper now, that uh, uh, a bill, uh, I will be introducing a bill tomorrow uh, in, in the Senate, a biosecurity amendment, no crime to return home bill. Uh, which will seek to uh, firstly remove or repeal the instrument, but make sure that doesn't happen again. It will certainly allow the continuation of powers uh, for a uh, minister to deal with people who are here, but never should we criminalise an Australian for wanting to return home. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Australia is very fortunate to share many things with our friends in India. We are both democracies. In fact, India is the largest democracy in the world. Uh, we obviously share a love of cricket. Uh, we share cuisine. We share the rule of law. We share many other legal and bureaucratic systems. And of course, in this day and age, uh, we share, like India, a growing Indian-Australian population. In fact, I saw some figures on the weekend which showed uh, that the Indian-Australian community is the, now the fastest growing uh, migrant community in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and I think we, we now have over 700,000 uh, Indian-Australians uh, living with us in this country and from whom we benefit. Uh, Indian-Australians have made an enormous contribution to our country. Uh, whether that be in academic fields, in business fields, in community areas, in sport, so many ways, our own country has been enriched by the contribution of Indian Australians. So you can well understand why Indian Australians feel so desperately abandoned by their government at this time. India, uh, the world's largest democracy, we all know, is going through an absolute crisis. Uh, in terms of COVID infection rates at the moment, and it is extremely distressing that several thousand Indian Australian citizens are stranded in India at the moment. And the important point there is that no matter where uh, these citizens may have been born, 
It may well have been in India, but these are Australian citizens who have been let down by their government. Uh, I had the great honour of uh, hosting a forum uh, this weekend just passed with leaders of Brisbane and Gold Coast Indian communities uh, that was joined by Senator Wong as shadow foreign minister and two of my other federal Labor colleagues. And it was entirely obvious the level of distress uh, that people in the Indian Australian community are experiencing right now. Now, this government has tried to make this an argument about whether Australia's borders should be closed at this moment in time, and that's not what this is about. There is no one arguing that we should be bringing back all several thousand Indian Australian citizens now, but what this government should have done is put in place quarantine facilities so that we could be bringing back people safely rather than leaving them stranded overseas. Thank you, Senator Watt. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 22. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I thank senators.